This is my interview with author Mel Eden here in Austin, and she has had many opportunities to craft her skill with titles, placing highly in various competitions, and yet titling her novel is an eternal struggle. So she shares the great story of a title she wrote that was less effective, not getting the clicks or the downloads, how she went back and revised that title using various research steps and came up with a better title that then got 500 downloads on a uh, promotional post. So uh, if you are struggling with titling your book, uh, or if you have several books out there that aren't performing as well as you think, they should, and you know, maybe you have a suspicion that the title might be involved. Uh, here's a great story, practical case study of improving a title, and we call out several specific steps that you can take to improve titles, different types of research that you can do, uh, the different principles that go into making a good, uh, catchy title that's searchable, popular enough to be searchable, but unique, <laughs> that resonates with readers, etc. So we go over all of those pieces. I hope you enjoy this interview. I had a lot of fun talking to Mel. Welcome! We are here today with author M.L. Eden, Mel Eden, here in Austin. So, uh, Mel, could you introduce yourself, what you write, and where people can find you? Hi, uh, I'm Mel Eden. You can find me online at mleden.com. So it's M-L-E-A-D-E-N.com. There's a sneaky A in that Eden there. Uh, and um, I'm also on Instagram and Facebook and Twitter and all the places, Blue Sky. So uh, I primarily write uh, queer urban fantasy. I also have some contemporary stuff, but most of it is queer because I am a queer person. So I, I try to uh, keep my writing, well, I don't try, but I do. I, I prefer to write stories about queer folks rather than you know just the normal everyday folks. So uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but... Um, yeah, uh, you know, I'm working on uh, a short story book is coming out um, that, that is urban fantasy around some of the stories I've written already. And then I have uh, my third book in the one of my series is coming out in March. So uh, looking forward to that. And, you know, I'm hanging out here in uh, the Austin Metro and uh, talking with Alex. Today, so. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. So yeah, we met at a local authors group yep. and a plug for your website. I checked out your blog and you had a great blog post on the experience of renting a table at a book fair. And yeah. one of the things that really drew me to you and why I wanted to do this interview is you're just very transparent about the process of uh, selling books and you have the background in titles. Uh, that we'll get into and you had this great example of how to take a title that's not working and turn it into one that is and so all of that is uh, We will uncover during this interview, but but check out check out that uh, Website with the blog post again, especially for authors because again, I love Mel's transparency Thank you. I I try to be a really transparent about how things are working for me because I think it not only helps me to talk about it because then I get feedback on it, but, and that's an important thing for any author. Uh, but, but it also gives other authors an idea of what's going on. It also gives like people that just assume like you publish one book and everything's great. And you're like on the gravy train to like, you know, riches is it, it, cause I swear my family thinks I have so much money coming in because, Oh, you've published five books. And you're gonna, I was like, no, no, like, you know, traditional traditional publishing you're you even there you know you're not making six figures you're lucky to make three you know like uh and we're talking like low three like if you get an advance of like two to five thousand on a book um and you're an unknown name that's pretty impressive uh and that's and that's pretty standard too um and then that's that's what's even worse is like that in traditional publishing is chunked out over like four quarters. So, <laughs> and you have to, 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 to get any royalties in traditional publishing, publishing, you have to basically uh, work out your advance. 
So you have to sell enough books to pay for your advance and then some and the public, you know, and um, all the expenses. And then you start seeing royalties. So if your book doesn't do or is like middle of the road or mid tier, as they call it, or uh, more of a, a slush pile book like oh yeah you sold like you know 10 12 whatever this quarter you're, you're not going to make your advance back you're not gonna um what do they call that uh is it advancing out or so, it's something there's a term that i'm blanking on but it's it's yeah and and if you're self-pub you're putting all the money up yourself up front you get all the profits off of that but that is is pretty meager these days too. no guaranteed advance right no 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 guaranteed advance <laughs> no guarantee that anybody will even buy your book um once you put it out there and because then you know first you have to write it so so as you know like it's writing is probably it seems like the hardest part but it's actually the easiest part because once you get past the writing then you have to figure out how to put the book together um, you know, and publication formatting, all of that stuff, get it onto the distribution platforms. And then the, the third job is marketing. And that's only if you did the first two right. Could Because you could do the marketing right and screw up the other two and then it doesn't matter. So like, um, <laughs> yeah. So, so it's, yeah. A, it's a complicated jigsaw puzzle of, of things um, that actually changes depending on the genre, depending on how many books you've published, um, who you're networked with, uh, all kinds of, you know, um, just what seemingly is like random is just like, and a little bit of luck too. I honestly think it, there's, there's a lot of luck involved in, in hitting a space and getting a story out there and having it be great because somebody's somebody's story could take off and have like the zeitgeist and everybody love it and everything. And then two years later, it's like crickets. You don't hear from that author again. You don't know what they're writing or their next book doesn't really land like, you know, so, so it's all those things. Yeah. Well, and, and th that's where the transparency helps because there's all of these variables and right? if it's a black box, good luck figuring them out. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so. and 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 it's hard, uh, and and that doesn't that that's that's accounting for if like everything in the world is normal, then it's not right now. So that <laughs> that even throws all that off, right? Yep. So yeah, um, but today we're here to talk about titles, which is a small puzzle piece in the bigger picture. <laughs> Right. Well, it's one of the things there's there's a few things that are probably going to sell your book the most. Yes. Uh, one is the title. Two is the cover. Yep. And I, talking to other authors, I think a very helpful third that is often missing is probably like a one sentence book pitch, i.e. Yeah. short enough to fit in a headline or an ad or something, right? Not a full paragraph blurb. But, you know, those are the types of things that are going to sell it. Um, I've talked a little bit about book uh, one sentence book pitches on my channel, uh, but I haven't dived into titles. And that's one reason why I was excited to talk to you is because you have a lot of experience. Um, and I think you have a fairly fleshed out process for improving it. So um, tell us a little bit about your background writing titles. So I uh, originally did not start in creative writing. I started in uh, journalism and tech writing. So a lot of my uh, titles and title structure and how I learned how to put together titles comes from a journalism background. I won a competition for um, a Kansas Association of uh, College uh, newspaper, collegiate newspapers. Um, it was third place for headline writing and an honorable mention for photography because, you know, when you're in college, you do all the things. Um, so uh, when you're working for a college newspaper and uh, learned how to put together really catchy, poignant, you know, short titles that are attention grabbing um, in the internet age. And this is slightly before the internet age. So, so there wasn't much about like, there wasn't, it wasn't the idea of clickbait because you got a newspaper. It was the idea that the title would grab your attention enough that you would go read the rest of the article. Right. That was, that was originally where it came from. So nowadays, you know, a lot of people form their opinions on the title alone. And if you don't read the article, the article could be structured, actually have facts, but be completely different than what the title's implying. So that's where they get the clickbait. That's where they get this idea that people actually don't read 
uh, articles anymore. They actually read the title and form an opinion based on a title of something that they find on the internet, regardless of what it is. So it it's, it's um, you know, smaller and smaller chunks of information and conveying that information as quickly as possible. Then you, you know, and then in journalism, you have, in my opinion, you have the responsibility to do the right thing and convey what you're writing correctly in five words or less, uh, which is really hard. It's not as easy as it would seem. And that is is a lot different in creative writing uh, and, and in creative spaces and titling because the titles you want in journalism and tech writing this is where you get like the top 10 of whatever top 10 best tech toys of uh, 2023 you know so that's very clickbait um that title draw you know regardless of whether you really want to know that you're like oh what are the top 10 it's a curiosity thing so i think the thing that is very you know the one thing that does translate over is trying to trying to draw the reader in with that curiosity like forming a question or forming a you know, yeah. a, like a, an interest in what the subject is. Um, other than that, it's wildly different. <laughs> well, I, I think there's one yeah. more piece, right, that you mentioned, the condensing. And that a lot of oh, authors yeah. have a hard yes, time. that's with. true. Condensing an article into a headline is difficult. Condensing a novel into a headline, <laughs> you know, is... Yeah. Uh, or, or two words. Is, I mean, we've right. seen, you've seen novels with just one word one you know and two or two words or this or that or you know uh uh object and and or um you know some of them some of them are full sentences now like that exactly describe what's going to happen in the book which is great i see this a lot in uh, uh web serials where it's like you know i'm the i woke up i died and woke up the evil villainess you know kind of situation and you're like oh, okay so i'm gonna read a a portal book about a villainess that, that wasn't originally a villainess, like somebody that, you know, woke up that way. Um, so sometimes they're just literally on the nose. A really good example of, of that is, which I think is a great title, is uh, Kimberly Lemming's um, That Time I Got Drunk and, and Saved a Demon, uh, first book in the Mead Mishap series. And it is literally... The character gets drunk and saves it accidentally saves a demon and then also falls in love because it's an HGA. So it's a rom com. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's a fantasy rom com. It's a rom fantasy. I don't know, like romance fantasy. Like they're rebranding and that's another thing that's a layer on top of it too. Like what what happens when they rebrand a genre or another another sub genre kind of forms out of something else. Anyway, that's another topic for later. <laughs> but um, you know, that title is dead on. It's exactly, it, it is selling you exactly what's on the cover. And um, that's great. That's awesome when you can do that. And I think, especially if you're doing rom-com, I think it lends it to doing that because you want to kind of have that funny, kooky uh, title that is like, oh, how did that happen? You know, I want to read about that. Um, and, and then you have things, you know, what did, what did, the really popular shadow and bone, right? Like you're mm -hmm. like, okay, I know it's going to be mystery thriller maybe and some magic involved possibly. So we're talking like fantasy, maybe um, epic fantasy, not high fantasy because there's still uh, some contemporary things going on in there, but it's not like, you know, you don't have cars. There aren't, you know, modern day things that we would recognize as modern day. But, it's more um, of a, a mood and it implies it some genre, but even then you have to really like think about that one to try and get the genre out of it. Right. Yeah. I mean, and there's, a, and, and that particular book, like incredible. I mean, I'm pointing that one out, but that's the one I remember that I kind of hit that or even push that kind of titling for creative writing for, for novels into that space of like, and an, and, you know, like, this and this, this and this, or this and that, or whatever, um, with serpents and skulls, like on the cover, like these object covers. Mm -hmm. So then that's part of it. So you have like two words with a part of it uh, that are kind of a contrast. Uh, and then you have uh, objects on the cover that are contrast. Um, so yeah, it, it, and, and, and that is particularly part of that, like, 
dystopian fantasy genre i think you get you either get the one word titles or you know um another one what was it uh well hunger games really straightforward title yeah like right off the bat right so uh i feel like that's um pretty much you know nails it you know what's going to happen you kind of know it's dystopian it's it's that feel immediately and you're and the curiosity of what does that actually mean so that's that that title layer of like does it does it spark curiosity is it short enough to convey exactly what the book is going to do for the reader or at least give enough of a hint that the reader's going to go okay yeah i i like that because it's got like you know, some mystery, dystopian, maybe it's YA, because it's like the the dual dueling title thing is is a very YA thing, I think. Um, you know, because Kimberly Lemming's book is very much adult. <laughs> Just mm-hmm. by the way, in case anybody I mean, you put drunk in the title, you're kind of, you know, uh leaning into <laughs> uh, adult uh romance comedy stuff. So um so yeah, so there's like there's contextual clues or what we would call uh contextual clues at least in english that give us what could be in the book and if if you miss um or if your readers don't pick up on the contextual clues they could pass your book up either because they don't know what's in there and they don't want to take a chance because books have gotten pretty expensive you know even even ebooks like most indies are selling ebooks around, you know, three, four, five dollars, somewhere around there. Um, if it's a trad pub, it could be eleven to twelve dollars. You might as well buy the paperback. I mean, that's kind of where I'm at with it. Like, I I'm boggled that anybody would buy a twelve dollar ebook, but you know, that's um, that's where the industry is at right now. So it it's, you know, do I take a chance on this author and spend my money? on a book that I'm not quite sure about. I mean, that's where the cover can kind of make up for some of that too, but you know, yeah, it all depends. I mean, the, the cover or a pitch. So right. it, this is an example I've used a lot, like the Gideon the Ninth um, yes, is not yeah. actually a, like a very communicative title. <laughs> at all. No, but the cover just lands it so well. The it's cover is great. Cover. And so, I don't think they came up with a pitch. They found one of the people reviewing the book that described the perfect pitch, which, which was uh, lesbian necromancers explore a haunted gothic mansion in space. Yes. And, uh, you know, based on that blurb, that's what I saw. And then I went and like, you know, read the more full book blurb and I'm like, okay, yeah, I love necromancers. <laughs> like <laughs> that, you know, that key word there is one of the things I just clued into that I'm like, yeah, one of my last impulse buys on Amazon also happened to be a necromancer series. So I guess I've got a thing, but like- <laughs> You're you're in a sub sub genre right. there, which is great. <laughs> No, but it, I, I mean, you can even shorten that down to lesbian necromancers in space. Yeah, and that, that's pretty dang interesting right mm-hmm. off the bat. You're like, Ooh, well, what? Like, to me, that would be it. It was like an instant thing. Now, getting into the book, I, I have to I have to like because I have read Gideon in the Night and I and I loved it when I got towards the end of it. But the beginning is a slog, uh, in my opinion, mostly because. I think I read it during the pandemic, so everything was slow. So it was just like, uh, ah, but I definitely, I identified with Gideon being bored because Mm -hmm. I was bored in parts of the book. Like you really felt like what was going on. So I was like, well, maybe that's a device in the book. So then, but that's a whole other, like, like that's the interior. We're talking (laughs) about the exterior, but uh, yeah. So it's the trifecta of title cover and blurb, right? Or at least like a couple of sentences that really hit home and you can be off on one of those, but if you know if you're really off, then the cover and the blurb aren't going to save you, um, unless somebody is describing your book, which which could which could help things. Um, but the the problem is is that a lot again going back to attention spans and what readers see, like I think the number one in that list is always the title. Yep. Yeah. So, cause especially, and this is what I, this is another little trick I learned um, Go and we'll get into some of the technical things around titles, but your book's not always going to be facing out with the cover beautifully displayed on a shelf. 
You know, the first thing anybody's going to see, unless they're browsing eBooks, is literally the title on the spine. So if you have a physical book on a shelf and the, no, if somebody can't read the title or they don't understand what it means, they're not going to pull the book off the shelf to figure it out. And they're certainly not going to know that, oh, that's about dragons because they, they can't see the dragons. The dragons are on the cover. The dragons are in the shelf. Like, <laughs> so, right. Yeah. So we can get into uh, yeah. how I figured that out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're moving. We're moving into this specific example. I feel so. Yeah. Uh, you had this great anecdote that you shared about uh, a book that uh, where the the title just wasn't selling. Like the book could sell. Like you, you could describe it to people as you were mentioning, yeah. but um, but they didn't get what the book was about from the title. Yeah. So I came up with the series. It's called the Saint George Chronicles, and um. I think if you're a dragon nerd and a history nerd and you really, really dig a lot of of just folklore around dragons themselves and, and how they're especially in European and Eastern European history, uh, you would probably have heard of St. George. If you grew up in the UK, you probably would have heard of St. George. If you grew up in Spain, you probably would have heard of St. George. If you grew up in Iran, you probably would have heard of St. George. These are places in the world where this is a particular saint that's actually uh, has holidays. Like the UK has a St. George holiday. And this is this goes back to a myth where St. George slew a dragon and saved a princess. It's a very old myth. And, and in some of the history and looking up and reading about it, it's actually, the myth is actually older than St. George. So, and there's variations on it. And and that wasn't, and, and St. George didn't just kill one dragon. He actually killed, he's known for killing a couple of different dragons. It just this particular one that the iconography we see a lot of is associated with a particular dragon where he saves a princess. So, um, so me, in my thinking, I am writing a story about a knight who has this ability to kill dragons. Uh, I am writing about dragons primarily uh, in, in a fantasy, in a contemporary urban fantasy setting um, with some, you know, science fiction-y uh, stuff thrown in with the magic because I can't stay out of sci-fi. I love sci-fi. So, And if you have magic, you know, it's the whole thing. If it, if the, you know, the science is advanced enough, it looks like magic to everybody else. So why not really blur the lines and have stuff that, you know, is it magic? Is it science? Did we put them together? Um, who knows? Uh, so I have layers in my book like that. So I thought, we'll just call it the St. George Chronicles because it's about this knight and the dragon and it has a heavy romance undertone they there it's an opposites attract it's uh you know um forbidden love kind of because this knight and dragon shouldn't be anywhere near each other because you know one can kill the other one with a spork if they wanted to uh because of the nature of their ability and so i thought yeah this will be great and you know people will get it well people did people that like people that got the book or read the blurb or had me explain or had somebody else explain to them or walked in a bookstore and had somebody hand sell it to them was like hey do you want gay dragons here you go and a knight and whatever um and and people are like oh dragon gay queer whatever uh and and romance that typically sells a book problem is if it's sitting on the shelf and you read saint george chronicles and you haven't had the same history background or nerdiness that I've had, you're not going to get it. You're not going to get it. Um, and I figured that out by talking with people because they were like, I would explain the book because they would see the dragons and talk with them about it. And then I was like, do you know what the myth of St. George is? And they're like, no. I didn't live like I, So I came up in, you know, humanities where we had to learn so much about European history and, and uh, Asian and East Asian history and just like history of the world. It, it was just part of what I learned. So the assumption, you, you make several assumptions when you put together titles and things and even in writing. Um, it, and that was my, that was my light bulb moment of, I have made an assumption here and it was incorrect um, that 
if you are a dragon nerd, you would know this mythology. Uh, I would probably have better luck depending on the generation of like, you know, having, having referenced something like Aragon or, or even, uh, you know, Oh, what's the really popular with toothless, um, how to train your dragon, how to train your dragon. Yeah. Like if it would, it would have been, Oh, these are lightning dragons, you know, or something like that. Like if I had, if I had leaned into like a couple of generations, this is showing my age right now. Um, you know, because, because everybody kind of knows, uh, Lord of the Rings and Smog, but it wasn't, it's like, that's not, it's not epic. I'm not writing epic fantasy. Um, I'm not even writing high fantasy, which is where it's, I, so then it's like, okay, do I have, is there a contemporary dragon story that I can plug into and still have the myth work? And I didn't, I didn't even think like that. So that's another layer of where you could go with how you could put things together. Um, so it occurred to me very quickly that I needed to change the title or figure out what the actual title of the book was. And so I kicked around a lot. Uh, and this is when I started, started learning how to do, um, SEO, which is search engine optimization. And this is another layer to the reality of being on the internet and selling books on the internet that you have to understand to actually have your book show up somewhere it has to be unique enough to only garner a couple of hits so that it it gets to the first page of whatever search you put in so if right. i call if someone's it, searching yeah. for your book name they have to be able to find it if it looks if it's the same as a bunch of other books or similar enough then you really might people might not be able to find it right right and i made that mistake with another books but we'll get we'll get to that in a minute so I made all the title mistakes. So even if I've you know done all this title and like things, you can be an expert, and I guarantee you the way you learn is by failing at like what you're trying to get to, um, which is great. You know that's what that's what the early books are for anyway. You're not failing; you're learning, and and that's the whole point. Um, so yeah, so I was like, okay, what can I name it? that would actually help with search function, you know, and, and describe it. So I'm trying, I was trying to get to three things. Describe the book enough that people would want, be interested, uh, it would generate curiosity. Have it be, a title be unique enough, it wouldn't get lost in a bunch of other books titled the same thing. And then also have it still make sense for the story. So, <laughs> so, so, uh, that's a tall order. That's a really hard thing to do, actually. Um, I had come up with a couple of different titles uh, that I figured out, okay, these titles were search optimized. And then they were kind of, they kind of talked about, you know, the story. And then it was like, which one actually generated interest? So um, I came down to the Dragon Saints. And the interesting thing about that one is, you know, it's about a knight and a dragon. I could have called it like the St. George dragon or the dragon's knight. Don't, don't do that. Just like, if you're writing a dragon book, just, you know, unless it's like epic high fantasy and you have a third word to put in there, don't, don't even use that anymore. There's like 50 books named the dragon's knight. Um, one of the options was the dragon shield because I was like, okay, I knew the second book in the story was dragon's lance. So I was like, well, maybe shield lance, I can go with an armor theme. Um, no, because that that's, you're running into problems there with uh, some D and D stuff, um, which they probably would have been okay with, but at the same time, I don't want to, I don't want to mess with D and D. Um, also again, I'm trying to convey contemporary fantasy, not high or epic fantasy. So that, that little off, right? Um, so I came down to, I was like, okay, this one has really good SEO. N not a lot comes up with it. I think there's like one or two other books and one of them is a children's book, I think maybe, if I remember right, um, called The Dragon Saint. And I, so now the title, I've flip-flopped it. So now the title is The Dragon Saint, The St. George Chronicles, Volume 1, which makes so much more sense to, to everybody. Because uh, I went from having, you know, 
a couple of downloads here and there, um, people coming across my book organically and really enjoying it, doing um, some review campaigns with Book Sprout where people really enjoyed the book uh, because they signed up for it because they read, like they get way more information in those, those campaigns than you would if you just come across it in a, in a Amazon suggests or a Kobu suggests whatever. So um, I did, so I followed up, I, I followed up with uh, several author circles of like, Hey, this is the title I'm thinking of going with. What do you think? Yeah, that sounds good. That sounds that, you know, got a really lot of positive peer feedback. And then I went uh, and put it in a promotion, like a one day promotion. Um, I put it in another promotion and got the highest it had gotten it in like a month long promotion. But then uh, there was a one day promotion with a lot of urban fantasy authors. And that was my that's my genre. Right. Uh, so I was like, OK, so if it if I could put it in this urban fantasy and see if it hits and, and it's a free download, let's let's go and see what happens. So in this promotion, all people see are the covers and the titles. That's it. You don't. You, that's what they initially get is a whole page. Well, and the author's name. So if you recognize author name, you're gonna you're gonna probably pick an author you recognize. But a majority of these were mid tier or lower indie authors, um, and the so all they had were title, cover, and author name. Don't know how long it is. Don't know I, and whatever's on the cover. You know the description. That's what you're going on when you're doing these kind of things. And this is what I was trying to test. So it was perfect for that kind of test. It was one day, and we, I like the campaign did really well overall. But I did the best I have ever done in any any uh can free campaign download newsletter whatever. It was. 500 downloads i maxed out my download for the day like because i had set a limit thinking i was never going to hit that limit and then hit that <laughs> limit and then i had the the person that ran the campaign came back to me and said hey somebody tried to download your book but it said they couldn't get to it and so i had to i had to send them a link so that they could get to the book because they actually were like well, i want this book you know um that's when you know you you've done you've hit something you know when you can do 500 downloads in a day um that was pretty cool i i would have to say i was i was i was like wow okay so the title makes way more sense now or at least garners enough curiosity that people are like clicking into it and then reading the description and then downloading so yeah. so to me that was a win because yeah. i have never had 500 of anything down, you know, it, it, I've never hit those numbers. A hundred and something, sure, but five hundred was like holy crap. Um, you know, in hindsight, I wish I had figured out how to like funnel it through uh, a particular, um, you know, platform or distribution other than a book funnel because then it would have helped a lot with algorithms and stuff like that. But I wasn't sure about the title. It was a test, right? So I didn't want to like. Yeah muck with everything all my distribution platforms just to test out a title so that's the other thing i would suggest if you're testing a title if you're doing a title test with something don't screw up your distribution to just do a title to figure out another way to do it without screwing that up so it did tell me i had a good title and that that you know once i get that in place i was probably going to have better distribution uh over the long term you know uh, with people actually spending money so um yeah. So that, that to me was like, okay, light bulb moment. And then and this is, this is the, I think this is what garnered like wanting to record this discussion too, because we had talked about this in the, the author group because it, it title is so important. So important. It, I, you know, and, um, yeah. And it, it like, yeah. And like I said, it's, it, you title and cover are exactly what you get. I mean, if you're a known author, you could probably throw like brand in as third and then blurb is fourth. But, you know, if you're an unknown, you know, blurb is going to go above your name. Like nobody's going to care what your <laughs> name is on yep. your book. <laughs> so, um, you know, that's well said. And I think there are just like the contrast, right, between this book that uh, is not selling as well as it could. Yeah. And 
I, I think I want to highlight just from that story, if you hadn't been hand selling it, you wouldn't know why. Right? Exactly. Because yeah. there's cover, because there's other things. But because you go to book fairs, you're hand selling it, you're talking to people, you see that like, okay, my like one sentence pitch or whatever, my short book blurb is working or they like the cover, but the title isn't resonating. And so yeah. that is what triggered you to go back through this process. And and uh, let's see if I can remember the steps of your process, right? So so there's some SEO element of like going back, searching what names already exist, what's unique. Yeah. Um, and, um, there, there was the getting feedback from other authors and, and, yeah. uh, you've already been getting feedback from, uh, you know, readers. Uh, and, and then the awesome. third part that I really liked and that I think a lot of authors could, um, could really take as a, a tool in their toolbox is going to one of these book promotion deals where your book has to compete just based on the title and the cover, right? and then test your title in that book promotion. Yes. Um, and then that gave you some concrete examples of how this this title might've been doing like five times better or whatever than before. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's some really inexpensive tools. Um, one of them is the uh, Publishers Rocket, which I think I paid 90 bucks for a, a lifetime license nice. that lets you plug in titles and seo and keyword searches and all kinds of really awesome stuff that gives you some information based on what amazon has for data so i you know i definitely recommend it because it helped me sort of kind of wrangle get right things wrangled around the seo especially since Amazon drives a lot of that SEO and, and not only for Amazon platform, but for Google and everybody else too, because, you know, if you put in a title, the first person, you know, the first platform um, distribution platform that comes up for a book is Amazon. Like, so they're, they're, they have a high influence. And I think the second one is probably Barnes and Noble, but Amazon definitely has a high influence on that SEO on the algorithms. So getting a hold of that information and plugging in words and figuring out was was like a couple of weeks worth of work, but it it helped. It helped a lot. Um, and and the other thing, the other tool I used was Book Funnel, also inexpensive. I think I have a membership that lets me do a certain number of downloads and um, some other features for authors. It's like a hundred bucks a year. Worth it. I think there's a free version that you know lets you do less. You can't do a lot of distribution with it, but you could do sales pages and things like that. Um, the the hundred dollar a year one lets you plug into like uh, doing uh, newsletter promos and things like that. So um, that is a really great place to test a title, to test a story, to test all kinds of things. Um, if you plug it into the right promo, that's the other problem, right? You got to figure out where it is. But once you do that, you know, you, you're, you're, you're in like Flynn, you're getting the data back, even, even if it's a passive reader kind of situation. And then, of course, the third thing that you pointed out and this takes networking, this takes getting to know like your bookstores in town, it takes getting to know the booksellers that aren't associated with bookstores, like some organizations um, that the bookstores are tangentially involved with, like, and, and understanding, you know, like, different uh, groups, like Armadillo Con is a, a really big a sci fi fantasy, uh, speculative fiction convention, I have met so many people through that group. Um, and the groups that have kind of spun off from there to that have helped me over the last couple of years um, figure this stuff out. So doing it on your, you can do a lot of it on your own with tools, but nothing beats like going to an author group and going, hey, how can I do this? Oh, hey, you know, there's this, you know, convention you can sign up for, or you can come here and do this one, or we're going to have this table, or we're going to have featured author indie offers at this bookstore, you know, would you be interested in? Um, I even, you know, and, and you can have other authors recommend you. And that's how I've gotten into a lot of things like, you know, doing author events at libraries and different bookstores and stuff like that, that network, uh, even uh, Zoe York, uh, who put out uh, Romancing Your Plan, which I know it says romance on the cover, 
doesn't matter. Whatever genre, it works for pretty much any genre um, you're working with. The idea is is like, you know, it walks you from A to Z, like how to put it, how to put it, together, what you have to look for, how to market it even. And then, but the, the very last chapter is like, you could be doing all the other things right. You have 95% of the puzzle, but if you don't do networking and get that feedback from actual people, you know, you have no idea what's going on, really. Yeah. Um, and that's a so. struggle for a lot of authors because we're a bunch of introverts. So, yeah, yeah. it's really <laughs> um, hard. But it's valuable. But absolutely valuable. And then this is, and so, and, you know, and what folks probably don't know is that this wasn't the first title I screwed up either. So, <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm actually, so going back to something I mentioned earlier, where, you know, we're talking about SEO and having like, 15, 20 books named the same thing. I have another book named Death Warmed Over. Thought it was very descriptive for a vampire book. Turns out not so much. Um, and also it is a, a Kevin J. Anderson book who has brand and has, you know, well known for Star Wars series and things like that. Um, and I'm not gonna compete, be able to compete with his brand or his SEO. His book is always gonna come out on top because it's 15 years old or older, I think, and named the exact same thing. It's like a murder mystery. Um, I do have some murder mystery in my book. So I'm in the right frame, but I'm still screwed on SEO. And if I had just stopped for a minute and went, I wonder if anybody else has this title because it's really catchy and whatever. Like, it, I think sometimes things get stuck in our head from things we see or hear or become like very common earworm-ish and we don't know where we got them from, it's always good to go search and just see where something comes up. Um, you know, and, and it doesn't matter that I actually use the same title, except for the fact that I wanted people to actually read the book. Uh, and it, that came down to it again, uh, hand selling and talking with people, you know, because when I I had a very short and and actually a couple of other booksellers told me how they were selling the book and I was just like that's brilliant and they were going like oh this is uh you know bisexual polyamory vampires with some mystery and adventure and I was like okay like that's really and a lot of people would just go you would say bisexual polyamory vampires and people are like okay yeah I'll buy it you know like <laughs> <laughs> you gotta know your reader yeah right yeah and and, and I think that was that was a really big thing for me. It's like, okay, people want to read the book. People like the book. I've gotten reviews on the book. It's, yeah, I've actually, I've actually, some people tell me that they wouldn't put a review on the book because it's too spicy for them to put their name next to a review. So, um, but people want to buy the book. So the problem is, is that nobody's going to find the book because it's buried in SEO. Um, so, and, and this again, went through this, a very similar process of like, how do I describe it? What am I actually going for? What is the, what is, what is the book actually, what story is it trying to tell? And, um, I'll be updating the title. Like I'm, I'm trying to finish like cover art and stuff like that, but, um, I'll be updating the title to Dr. Mason only dies at night. And I've gotten feedback. Again, gone to the authors. Hey, what do you think? You know, um, gone to the booksellers that were that they're currently selling it, and uh, people that have read it and asked them what they thought. And the, and the immediate response was, "I would read that book because it curiosity titles catchy, and it also there's a bit of a mystery twist. It's like, why do they only die at night? You know, why does she only?" who is this person? Like what's going on? So, and it conveys a lot of like what the book is doing. So I, I was like, okay, all right. And it, this is where I had wished I had paused after I had finished the book and edited the book and really understood how titles worked in creative, you know, uh, fiction, especially genre fiction. Uh, and, and, there were hints and things about like, oh yeah, you know, you need to research your genre. When they say research your genre, they actually mean go look at the titles of the things that people are putting out. Um, understand like, so like we talked about earlier, 
when, when we talk about YA and it's a, it's an object cover and they have a, a this and that title or a this and this or whatever, you know, a two word title or a one word title. Um, that's very much a genre. That's that. And there's a whole lot of reasons for why that's happening. That is a whole other podcast. But the, the, the point is, is to be able to land the right title with the right vibe, with the right information being conveyed to the reader or the person buying the book um, is, is really a lot harder <laughs> than we think it is, you know, and th this is why they have big ass marketing departments that come <laughs> up with titles. I think Katie Robert once mentioned that she doesn't come up with her titles at all. They absolutely do let the, their, um, pub do that for them so they all their current big series that's the the dark olympic series the dark olympus series they, they didn't come up with any of those titles so and and they're like oh no i suck at titles i don't want to come up with my own titles so it was like oh, okay you know and they've been doing this for like 10 or 15 years so she, she she's really good at it uh she's a really good writer really you know contemporary fantasy same kind of lane but a little different um and, and still like is just no title mm -mm. like you know like, it's like, hard it's hard it is so hard so i mean even if you have to have to like go back and redo a title or redo something that's okay so don't don't it's a learning it's all a learning process and yeah. maybe you know maybe next time you stop and you go oh uh Okay, let me, let me, you know, I, it took me, I don't know how many years to get to the point where I'm like, okay, this is how I, this is how I edit my book. This is how I, I figure out what the cover should be. This is how, this is how I kind of test a title. Um, and, you know, just all kinds of things. Instead of just kind of, eh, I'm going to slap it on there and, you know, <laughs> you can do that too. And sometimes right. you get lucky and that's okay. Like, it, you know, I, trust i you know have absolutely done that with some things and people are just like oh that's really cool and then it's just i was like oh okay that works great i you know <laughs> the less brain power you have to use the better but unfortunately being an indie pub or self pub even with a small indie press you're coming up with a lot of this stuff and and then trying to figure out the right the exact right thing to narrow everything down to make book magic basically Yep. Well, and and hand sell, run promotions to test things. That's that's how you're going to figure it out. And you're going to make different mistakes. And oh I think God. that's yeah. something that these two experiences highlighted, right? It's, you didn't make the same mistake twice. I like didn't. in the St. George Chronicles, it was so specific that people didn't get it, right? It was right. very it was very unique, but people didn't get it and just didn't process because it wasn't popular enough. The concepts weren't popularly known enough. Uh, on the other hand, I, death warmed over was such a common phrase <laughs> that like it wasn't unique enough to stand out. So you kind yeah. of you you kind of experience both extremes. Yes, and then and then the the other layer to that is the technical part of it, right? Like mm -hmm. what fonts you're using, uh, what is your brand font? Like how are you putting that on the cover? Are you know what what is the font that you picked conveying? Is it is it genre? Is it leaning into a genre? Are you leaning into horror mystery or do you want fantasy mystery? Like you can live all of that, you know, and how you place it on the cover even. Is it at the top? Is it the middle? Is mm -hmm. the bottom? Like what does it look like on the spine? All of those things affect, you know, what, what the title is and, you know, and the accessibility to that title. So like how, the font looks, if people can read it, like if they can read it on the spine. Um, I, I did have that problem with the second volume of St. George. Like the titling was in uh, white against a very light blue on the spine. You couldn't read it from like four feet away. I was like, crap. So I went back to my cover artist and I was like, hey, can we darken the lettering on the spine? Because I can't read it on the shelf. There's no, there's, it's just not visible. And they were like, oh, yeah, you know, we didn't think about that because I was very focused on like ebooks and what people would see in the cover when assuming that the cover would be the thing. So you so you have to think about all the sides of the book. Yep. <laughs> right. Yeah. So 
That's a topic for a completely other day. We just talked about the content, like the words of the title, but like right. the presentation of the title is its own <laughs> is its, its own it's, piece yeah, in terms of like font and placement and in, all of that. Yeah. And if you have a cover artist, that will help you with that. Mm -hmm. But also you have to stick up for yourself too. Like if you're working with somebody and go, hey, this is a little weird or I don't like this or this font is, you know, I have one cover artist I know I went through with the uh, vampire book we played with fonts for like two weeks because I was just like, I don't like that. No, you know, like it was, and very patient with me, thankfully. And we landed on something I liked and now I'm changing the whole thing. So, you know, <laughs> that like, happens. Like it happens. It happens. So just, you know, be prepared, like, and be prepared for something not to work and, and to be okay with changing it. That's mm -hmm. the advantage of being indie is that in self pub is that you have control over all of that like you know if your title is not working if all of that is that is you know if you're a trad pub you have no control over cover title like how it sells what they're doing for marketing um all of that is determined by the publisher and sometimes you just have to live with it and that that i think sucks i don't know that i could ever be trad pub unless like Somebody was like, oh, you have creative control because I, otherwise I would just drive myself nuts. So I think we're going to see some big changes in that specifically Absolutely. with uh, some data that I'm seeing like indie writers are starting to make more like 22 versus uh, 2022 versus 2021. Um, yeah. And so we'll see that like publishers are, I think, going to have to work harder to keep their authors uh, in part because uh, authors who are willing to do these steps, right, willing to put the time in with the marketing and the business are yeah. going to start being able to sell a lot more of their books. Yeah, I I absolutely think that's the same thing. And, you know, um, a lot of I, I feel like it's, a, it's very similar to music in the creative industry and how having these different streaming platforms have really opened up how music gets to people um without having to get like some a and r person and you know same thing with like i i tried to do querying an agent and mm -hmm. bless anybody that keeps going through that rejection i <laughs> i did it like eight times got eight rejections some of them were personal rejections which were like hey this looks really great you know it just needs a little bit more needs some of this or that and the other and i was like why am i doing this to myself um you know, because I was just like, I, I don't know everything, but there were at this point in publishing, there are enough tools out here that I don't have to. And there's a lot of groups that you can go to and get help from. And that's what that, that's the cool part right now. And that's the cool. That's that's why I could go back to the really very beginning of where we were talking about the why I'm so transparent in what I'm doing is as that information somebody's going to find that's coming behind me and trying to figure shit out, they're going to pick up the blog and go, oh, wow, okay, you know, and a light bulb is going to go off for them. And that's going to be great. Awesome. Thank you. Well, so to close this out, what yeah. is your current marketing goal or challenge? Uh, Well, considering the world's on fire right now, and it's kind of been on fire, but not as, like, I feel like the pandemic was sort of like the smoldering to the, the actual fire that we're kind of in now, um, you know, between the pandemic and climate and, uh, you know, Palestine, it's, it, it feels like a lot and it feels really hard to be out there going, Hey, buy my book. You know, I know the world's crap right now, but here's, you know, here's a fantasy read. Um, so a lot of, a lot of what I've been doing is, is reassessing and trying to figure out what's what's the best balance, what's to be, what's the responsibility I have as an author, as somebody also writing um, and, and participating in, in social platforms, uh, you know, wanting to make sure that the right thing is being focused on, but also trying not to lose what ground I've made in marketing. And I think I think it's going to be really hard um, for a lot of people. I know a lot of people and and. Twitter just totally being obliterated by a megalomaniac is is really hurt a lot of people's sales. I know it's hurt my sales too. So it's it's hard to figure out what's next. And I think a lot of us are trying different ways to do that. Um, 
I, I've been exploring different platforms. I am not on TikTok yet, but we'll probably be on TikTok soon because I don't see how we survive Twitter failing with that, you know, without having TikTok or vice versa. So, um, yeah, I think that's where things are going. A uh, very video oriented versus text. Yeah. And we're, we're going to have to get used to it. And that's, that's kind of, but I'm all, I'm pondering all of this and it's like, <laughs> you know, Oh yeah. Finding your place, finding your audience. You, you have to find the right network. Um, and yeah, I think there's, I, I have not seen very many people for whom like Twitter is a very effective social engine. I mean, even before changes, uh, but then I occasionally I run into someone who does or like someone who's like, I really like Tumblr, like really Tumblr is working for you. <laughs> well, anyway, we're Reddit, like Reddit, Reddit you would think mm -hmm. the same thing, but the people there have been in Discord. I have, I've yeah. actually, it hasn't generated the numbers that Twitter was generating for me, but mm -hmm. I have hit certain things in certain places, diff different Discords, different uh, Reddits. I haven't tried Tumblr yet, but you know, a, there are things that that do work for certain authors because it, it, their their people, their readers are there, and I think all of us are just trying to put together enough of the puzzle to find the readers. And yep. uh, eventually, I'll do that because I'm I'm kind of in a niche genre too. Like I'm mostly, you know, I feel like I'm mostly marketing to other queer authors at this point. Um, you know, and I and and that's okay. I'm okay with that because I read other queer authors' works too, and we're all sitting around going, "Oh, yay, queer fiction!" You know, it's like um, it's a nice community in terms of a niche, yeah. right? Like there's there's a clear niche. It's 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 identifiable. You can um, you can relate. And actually, this is something I just learned when I was doing a video on the uh, a survey of indie authors' income for 2022. But like actually, the LGBTQ plus space. Uh, like as a genre or niche did fairly well. It it did better than generic fantasy and, and, um, and uh, sci-fi. Yeah. Well, and I, th I think that lends credit to the fact that everybody wants more representation. Mm -hmm. um, when you have marginalized or under underrepresented folks finally in spaces where we haven't primarily seen them, it makes all the difference. It makes all the difference in book sales. It makes all... I, you know, read a lot of BIPOC authors um, because it's not been available. And, and half the time you didn't, you, it wasn't even pointed out or it was in a completely different section mm -hmm. of the bookstore. But the internet has opened a lot of that up. And if you're a reader and you aren't reading a, a diverse group of authors at this point, I would definitely challenge you to go find some diverse authors or have, get some recommendations because there are so many great writers out there doing so many awesome stories um, that have, you know, different cultural perspective, different creative eyes, different, you know, different kinds of prose all, all over the place. It's, it's just an interesting time to be a reader, I think, too. Like, there is just so much available um, and, and, and on a budget. Like, there's a lot of things you could find very inexpensively. Like, you know, somebody testing out their title on a promo. <laughs> <laughs> on a promo, yeah, check out book promos. If you're going to give your advice to authors in one sentence, what would it be? Search your title. There you go. <laughs> whatever, whatever you, whatever it is, I, I don't care. I don't care if it's a, if it's a, a, a you know, journal, if it's a um, news article, it's, I mean, just, just know, know what the hell's going on with whatever thing you think is your title, like, um, in the, the cyber space, because I guarantee you, you will make the similar mistakes I've made where you're either, you know, oh, it's associated with this, or you're associating, like, people have made unfortunate mistakes with, like, their titles have gotten associated with, you know, some tragedy or some epic, you know, bad thing that you're like, ah, now my book's associated with this. Um, you know, I got lucky and none of my stuff has like been associated with anything really bad, but then again, none of it's really either too specific or too, too much of it. Um, so, so just be aware of what is around your title and what words you're using. And cause that's going to be the first thing. I mean, the cover, yes, but like if you, like I said, if you're on a shelf, it's the spine. 
Everybody sees first. And that's 90% of books are spines. So you're not going to get that pretty cover that you worked on. They're not going to see that first. So you have to really focus on your title and what it means and uh, what it means to the reader. So make sure you plug it in into some search engine and uh, get some information back about it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mel. Uh, Remind people where to find you. Uh, uh, M-L-E-D-E-N, E-A-D-E-N dot com. All right. So uh, go check out our work, check out our blogs, other authors to see behind the scenes. And uh, thanks again. No problem. Thank you. So what did you think of the interview? Do you have additional questions about crafting titles? Put them down below. I can always reach back out to Mel and forward your questions. If you just have uh, comments or want feedback on the titles that you're working on, go ahead and throw those in the comment below. If you're wondering what to watch next and you like local Austin interviews, then go ahead and check out my interview with Austin author Abby Goldsmith. If you're wondering how to better promote and market your books, then maybe you want to go ahead and check out my book pitch video. This is what goes into a good book pitch, and it's insights I gleaned from having lunch with local authors.